Thank you so much for tuning in to She's All Over the Place with Kiriaki. That's me. Welcome back. I have an exciting special guest for you. I'm her biggest fan in the whole entire world. Her name is Sarah Jane Sherman. Sarah is an Emmy Award winning voice director and a three time Emmy nominated casting director. She is currently casting and or voice directing on projects for Apple, Netflix, Nickelodeon, Disney TV Animation, Fox, Cartoon Network, Warner Brothers, Adult Swim, and HBO Max. Some of her recent projects include Animaniacs, The Cuphead Show, Scooby-Doo Looney Tunes Cartoons, My Dad the Bounty Hunter, Tig and Seek, Disney's Eureka, Disney's Hamster and Gretel, and Wolf Boy and the Everything Factory. Before that, she was Jon Stewart's head of casting for his animated project with HBO. The majority of her casting career was at Disney Television Animation, where she spent 12 years learning how to cast an animated series. This is where I met Sarah in 2014. I'll never forget what happened. It was 2014. I just got back to Los Angeles and somehow I had a cool audition and we met and she was just so nurturing and so kind and so calm. She wanted me to come back and do an in-house reel for me. Like, I mean, as a voiceover actor, as a talent to have that space She's the head of casting for Disney. She had me come in and her assistant sent me like 13 different animation projects. I I remember Mabel Pines was my absolute favorite. So I came in, we recorded the in-house demo. I saw her office. It was like had all these toys. It was just so fun. And you were growing through some transitions in your life uh, during that time too, which I remember. But yeah, and that's how we met. And I've been a big fan ever since. And so it's an honor. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Wow, thank you so much. That's quite an introduction. I feel like after that, uh, I seem tired. I feel like I'm doing (laughs) all of that. It's like, wow, I I am tired. You're right. I am doing a lot of different things. But uh, yes, I remember it's been, you know, I've known you for a long time now. It's been great. Almost a decade. Wow. Wow. So the the important thing to do is just sleep as much as possible. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So um, diving in, before we met and you were at Disney, uh, let's take it back. So what was your intuitive hit of voiceover, animation, the career of, you know, casting, directing? Like, how was your journey? How did it start for you? No, oh, that's a great question. I pretty much fell into it. I started out as a production assistant for Steven Bochco at the time had NYPD Blue, the television show on Fox going, a live action show. And someone I had had an internship with, Meredith Roberts, called me and asked me if I wanted to work in children's television in development. And it was that time in development that got me in with her with children's television so that when she went to go work for Disney, she brought me over as well. It didn't work out for me in development, but I had created a great connection with Dave Wright in the casting department and he brought me down to work with him. So everything just kind of fell into place with networking and just kind of jobs just appeared. And I said, okay, I'd like to try that. Yeah, sure. I'd like to try that. I'd always considered myself a fan of acting, of uh, actors' performances, someone that watched the credits. Um, see who was doing what role, but I didn't even know that casting for cartoons was a job, you know? So I started out doing this as a coordinator, really just learning how to cast a show. And the first show that they assigned me was Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, uh, which, you know, was in its, you know, second or third season by then. And, you know, the Fab Five of Rusie Taylor, Wayne Allwine, Bill Farmer, Tony Anselmo, Tress McNeil. And then kind of I would just schedule them every week and then any incidental roles that need to be cast. Um, but with that group, you're just assigning them a second voice in the show because they're also talented. Or bringing in a guest stars, like if there's a Santa Claus in that episode for our Christmas special or Mrs. Claus and casting those roles. So kind of starting with a show that was already up and running and then they slowly start to expand you into new shows where you start to get pilots and then get on series and work your way up that way. Yeah, very cool. Um, I remember Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. I loved it because I would be doing babysitting jobs in, in California. So I, I would be watching it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, And something really important that you said that I would like to highlight on, because I think it's very difficult for people with the art of communication and networking and building these great relationships authentically. So, you know, when anyone sees you right now and just feels your tone and your vibe, they can overall hear, you know, your essence. But 
What are some skill sets that you learned maybe from your family members or mentors along the way to be able to like go with that intuitive hit of like, oh, like this person's cool. I want to develop a relationship. Like what kind of value do you add? How do you authentically just step by step when you like nurture a relationship, especially early on in those days before, you know, you created golden mountains of success for yourself? I mean, I think the key to what you're saying is authentic. You know, you said it twice and I think it's worth saying, you know, a third time there because so much with social media, you can just, oh, I followed that person and now I'm their best friend. Or, you know, you think maybe you know a little bit more than you do about a person because they put their likes out there or, you know, you force it. I think it does have to come from somewhat natural places. You kind of get together and get to meet and have real conversations. I think, you know, and this can even fall under auditioning as well. But being true to yourself and introducing yourself as a human, not someone that needs a job or not somebody that I'll do anything you need. What do you need? Do you need me to do this? Do you need me to do this? You know, but kind of coming to a place. Oh, I love doing this. And I love doing this. Let's see how we can, you know, make something creative together. And my comedic sensibilities match your comedic sensibilities. Let's try to, you know, bring that together. Because I think when people are inauthentic, when they are just trying to please or are just trying to make somebody like them or get on somebody's good side, you feel that, you know, you feel that, uh, I don't want to say insecurity with it, but you feel kind of like a, you know, superficial connection or something. It, it, It isn't quite there. So, you know, being true to yourself and letting who you are shine when you meet people. I mean, there's so many, I mean, with the pandemic, it's it's obviously a lot more challenging, but finding the ways in these social situations, at callback auditions, even, you know, we always say, you know, the callback audition starts when you get on the premises too, which is how you are and as a kind of in the waiting room and how, hey, I didn't get my sides. Can I have those? Or, hey, I have a couple questions or just even those hellos you say at the beginning before you go in and do your business. I mean, that even starts to establish the relationships there, but art shows and screenings and things like that, you know, just getting to know people is what I love, you know, and then I love to cast people in roles that make sense for them. So I love kind of watching that all come together. Did I answer your question in any way, shape or form? I want to make sure I got that. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I love it all. And I'm just going to dissect it a bit. But it's just like, put your best foot forward. Like it's show business, be professional, like show that you're a human, but be professional about it. Find common interests and come from an exciting kind of a manifesting kind of place instead of the what you said, insecurity. And that for what I'm saying is that desperation, because I see actors all the time, and they're just so desperate to people please and to obtain that which is which gets in the way of the creativity part. And you want to actually get to the the good clarification of the creativity part, like you said, like you just how you can apply that to the craft too. So networking and then applying that to the craft. That totally makes sense. Thank you for sharing that. I I just think I know actors and people hear it. And it's like, I feel like, you know, they say with like Coca-Cola or a brand, you have to like see it 15 times before it registers. So like the more people hear it, the more like confidence boosts they get to maybe check in with themselves with their authenticity, which goes into the craft of, you know, acting and, and voiceovers. Pivoting right along. So then what happens? So then you're you're at Disney. Yes. Disney, uh, working my kind of way up through the ranks there. And uh, I was kind of the uh, second in command there. And so I got a call out of the blue from Jon Stewart to go work with him um, on a blue political parody he was doing with HBO. And this was my chance to work in adult animation, which I hadn't done yet, and to be a head of casting. So that was kind of exciting for me taking that next step in my career. So I went ahead and accepted that job and learned really fast that I knew how to cast a Disney show, not necessarily just, you know, an adult animated Jon Stewart show (laughs) that he was doing. And he ran this uh, in a very fast paced environment, similar to the daily show where he wanted to produce animated content very, very quickly. And as you know, animation can take some time. Casting can take some time. While I might've had eight weeks to cast a pilot for Disney, I had eight hours to cast and record a show, you know, a show daily for this. Um, So it was just a whole new mindset and uh, taught me a whole new set of skills of just how to to approach things and how to do things. So that was wild. (laughs) When it comes to maybe the the language of the script, going from 
you know, kid stuff and then transitioning to adult. Do you remember some innate like weird things that you noticed or like, did you like, how was that transition with working with maybe all rainbows and butterflies and then transitioning to more adult stuff and with the content first and foremost? I mean, there were swear words in my audition copy. I mean, that's the first and foremost. (laughs) That's a shocker for me. I mean, I'm no, you know, I don't mind swearing, but it was a big difference between casting a Disney show and then F-bombs that were in my copy. And it, it also kind of framing the shows that I was auditioning at Disney or, you know, sending out for auditions. I didn't have to do any trigger warnings or any, you know, hey, adult content, things like that. Um, now all of a sudden I found myself in a different way with, oh, just making sure that this is very, you know, sensitive material. Please don't be offended. There are swear words in there. Things like that. I started having to put warnings, uh, graphic material or whatever, not just for that, but as I started to do more adult shows. But I mean, that's crazy, right? That's, that's a huge pendulum swing. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, your family's like, uh, so Sarah, honey, what are you getting into over here? <laughs> it's funny because yeah. one of the shows I had to cast a pilot. So it's one thing to do adult animation where the adults are swearing, but I had to do one where, you know, children are swearing. Oh. And I was auditioning real kids for these roles. You know, that was something very different for me as well. Kind of just, yeah, the opposite yeah. of looking for young kids doing voices yeah. on Disney Junior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like looking at the parent. You're like, are you sure this is okay? <laughs> yeah. Was that all online or was it ever in the room at, at this point when you were doing this kind of work? You know, it's, it's funny. I feel like we've been uh, in this pandemic for so long. I don't even remember before it. But yeah, I mean, th- everything has been online. I haven't done, I've only done one show in the last month that was callbacks were in person. Everything has still been online. And how do you like it? The transition from, you know, time, energy, um, in person or, doing things virtual. Do you like it better or how is it for you? Definitely has pros and cons both ways. You think, yeah, you save money on commuting. I don't have to drive anywhere and I could just walk, you know, downstairs, which is great. But, you know, then we were giving a half hour sanitation time in between each actor where it was kind of like, you know, just downtime where I'd have to wait for the room to be cleaned. Or we were doing remote records for people who had never done a remote record before. So they were having to do, you know, doing all their setup tests while we're waiting for them. Oh, they're having a tech issue. Okay. They don't know, you know, weren't sure how to work their uh, machinery. So the engineer was coming in and trying to fix it. So that was taking a little bit of time, you know, things, this is a silly one, but even talent then having to repeat the take number in the slate. So it's like the engineer says it, then the talent repeats it, then the talent says they're like, you know, just everything was kind of taking that one extra step. So it almost evens out with the commute. I don't have to go anywhere, but it tends to take, you know, just as much time to do everything. I think I can get more shows done in a day. You know, if one show ends at two, I could start my next one at two. You know, I don't have to wait. Oh, I have to drive to get to the next location. You can just go from one session to the next, but then I don't get up. Yeah, <laughs> my yeah. step count goes from, you know, 7,000 steps a day to 2,000 steps a day. That kind yeah. Of thing, so. yeah. In regards to hearing the talent, like they're, you know, with them being in the room or just uh, listening, do you think the reads are different? How are the reads from actually people being in the room and then you receiving them um, just by MP3 now? I think for the most part, the reads are good. The only part where it gets tricky is when they're not used to engineering for themselves. So they're not just focused on the words, the dialogue, the acting. They're like, oh, did I peek? Okay, did I do that? You know, they're constantly checking to make sure their levels are okay and all of that because then they can't fully, you know, be connected in the character because then they're playing this other role the whole time as well. Yeah, yeah. So um, like speaking from, you know, this side of the mic, the actor, you know, there's that balance of in between and I've asked enough questions to know. It's like, and I would like to hear from you, but it's like, they want to hear you. You, you, I'm, I'm just saying like the read, the, the voice, right? And then the, the technical doesn't have to be super on par. Like, obviously, you don't want, you know, big noises happening. But if the technical aspect isn't like 1000%, but it's a good read, at that point, would you ask someone for a callback or bring him into the studio to do a callback with them or, or get on the Skype or something and redirect them if you like their voice? Like, how is it? Or is it just we don't have time for that? Like, how is it for you when you hear someone, but you really like their voice, but maybe the tech isn't 
agent, 1000% amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think for auditions, I'm fine with that. You know, for me, that doesn't make a difference. I think as long as we can hear their voice clearly and understand the character and understand their read and, you know, get a good sense of the character, then I'm fine with that. You know, I have had some studios that really do use those auditions as kind of a baseline test for sound equipment. You know, but for me personally, in casting someone, I am really listen for the talent, not necessarily for their quality of their home setup. Yeah, a lot of times they're like, oh, if you plan on recording from home at the end, give your slate and say your mic and the kind of mic and make sure it's treated of how you would be recording it if you were going to be booking it from home. Very cool. And then how is it with receiving with the projects that you're doing, the the quality of a mic that a talent has? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, having a great mic is fantastic for the actual record, you know, especially if you're doing broadcast quality records from home, like that's great. But we're a little bit more lenient on those auditions. You know, some people have their USB mics or podcast microphones and things that they use uh, for auditions. And I think that's totally fine. But then when they record, it'd be great to get uh, some of the nicer microphones, of course. I'm yeah. recording on a TLM 103. It was uh, a gift that I got for myself in 2020 to honor my voice and my craft. So it, it's my baby. My, yeah. <laughs> but my TLM 103 is my baby. I find, let me know what you think because you're the animation queen. But I found with animation... I like a condenser mic because it's like more of a full body mic rather than a directional mic for animation. Is there a difference for you on the quality of mic if it's condenser or directional? How is that for you? Do you notice the difference? You know, I mean, for audition purposes, I'm not so picky about it, but tech isn't necessarily my thing. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't consider myself a, a tech person, so I don't think I'd be the right person to answer this, but I will say different mics work better for different vocal qualities. You know, mm-hmm. just kind of don't be afraid to try a few things out. I think there are some companies that will lend you some microphones just to try out a bunch and see how they work with your vocal quality. People mm-hmm. that have higher pitch voices versus kind of a low resonance you know, I think that, that, you know, that would be impacted by the type of mic that you use. So um, just flagging that as well. But for audition purposes, yeah, I, th- I think you were, you were right that with what you said, but I wouldn't consider myself the, the right person to ask that question. Okay. Uh, yeah, because you're hearing it. So you're listening more for the quality of the, the choices of the actor. Of the acting and of the vocal quality, the comedy. Yes. Cool. And then I saw recently on your Twitter, because you are a boss and you do VO tips all the time, which is so cool. Super bullish on that. Uh, One of the, I'm going to paraphrase it here, but you were mentioning, you know, the lows of the lows of the character and then being able to flip it and go to the high. So, and then when I did some workshops with you as well, oh, wow. I mean, you will really have an amazing time in these workshops. I mean, it's a full day workshop. I mean, you have like a lunch break, but like you like you're eating and you're like getting back to work. Sarah really puts you to work. Like you really (laughs) want to get in her workshop classes, get on a wait list and just sign up now. Like if you're like, oh, I want to get, you know, I want to do this animation thing with Sarah. I'm going to give you a website. It's going to be in the show notes. You definitely want to, if you're like, oh, I'm going to do it or I'm going to save up to do it. You just want to get on the wait list now. So then you're able to do it by time you're actually psychologically ready to do it. So there's like a, a tip for you. Okay. In the meantime, definitely go to Sarah's Twitter and follow her. You give these voiceover tips. So I just love that about you. It's You're so nurturing. You know, you're so kind and so gracious with this just like baseline education to really empower the talent, you know? So share when you started doing the VO tips. Yeah, I mean, I really love doing those tips. And, you know, sometime last year, it kind of got a boost, I think, from a voice actor. And then suddenly, you know, ended up being a lot bigger. And then I was working on trying to do them every day, but then I ran out of tips, I think. Uh, So now I just kind of do them when I think of them. Sometimes I try to do questions that people are afraid to ask or too embarrassed to ask or don't realize they don't know. So I try to do ones that seem very obvious, you know, like, duh, everybody knows that. Just in case there's one person that didn't. And so they walk into a room and say, oh, I didn't realize OS meant off screen. Okay, good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Just something as simple as that or to submit an MP3. You know, you said MP3 earlier instead of a wave 
or an AIFF, just how you submit your audition. So it started out with just those types of tips. And then I started to get kind of, you know, very specific with it, getting in the weeds as, you know, right now I'm directing 40 hours a week. So, or, you know, if I have a nine to one or two to six, something will come up in the session. I'll be like, great, I'll highlight that. This is something worth making a tip over. But the funny thing is I have to almost separate it a little bit more because one actor said, is this tip about me? And I've gotten that more than once. And I was like, no, it has nothing to do about you. Well, you're just in a session and then you said that. And I was like, no, it has nothing to <laughs> to do with you. So sometimes it's just, you know, things I think of or, you know, that kind of pop into my head or, you know, that kind of stuff that I think everyone could benefit from. But I'll just preface it. It's never about you. Who's ever listening? <laughs> yeah. It's not about and, one person in particular. <laughs> yeah. And then you have a contact sheet on your um, website. So maybe if someone's listening and they do have a question, maybe they can submit it. And then maybe one day it'll be on the Twitter tips, you know, to like support certain things. I don't know if people already do that or not. Maybe ask questions about certain things and then you do those VO tips. I'm not sure if you have that yeah, option available. No, that's great. That is interesting you say that. Sometimes I get uh, direct messages and sometimes it's hard to write a whole thoughtful answer in a direct message it's just to one person when 900 other people have that same question. Yeah, I'd rather answer it in the full forum in front of everyone. So yeah, if you even DM me a question, I can do my best to answer it for everybody, you know, so everyone can see it. Yeah, I was in a Twitter spaces last night. They were having me on because I was on Minecraft uh, story mode too. I played four characters and Soup was one of my main characters. And the woman, she's like, oh my gosh, my 10 year old daughter, she's on a Netflix show. I was like, oh, cool. And I was telling her about you and how you're the best anime director and coach. And so I'm like, yeah, contact me. We'll, we'll get you set up and things like that. But you know, for adults and for children, so you have courses that you do workshops and you divide it. So some are from adults and then they can participate. And then you, if people just want to audit because everyone's at different boundaries, levels of jumping in and just kind of coming in and being the observer, you have an audit opportunity and then you have an adult workshop and they're limited, I think, to 12 people um, yep. in the workshop. And then you have them for children as well. So like parents who are listening, you know, or, or want to share this with, you know, people who could, you know, have their children be involved. You you do both. So you have workshops and then also you have private coaching. So not only do you have private coachings to work with talent, but then you also have private coachings if there's a specific audition where they can book you to work with you. And then that's all on the website. So we'll have you share the website now if you want to. Yeah, it's just uh, my name, sarahjanesherman.com. And it's S-A-R-A, Jane, J-A-N-E, Sherman.com. Yeah, great. Um, And then anything you want to share about workshops and classes? Absolutely. I do want to say too, for the kids' classes, we don't have auditors. You know, parents are more than welcome to listen in, but I'm very particular about auditing kids classes where you you know people don't have their cameras on and so we don't have any auditors for the kids classes you know I started opening those up with, with adding a little bit more of games and stuff to getting kids used to being directed by someone else you know I think if kids are just starting in the voiceover business it's good to have them directed by someone else before their first actual booking so that's not just their parent that is telling them how to do something or you know they're not used to a stranger giving them feedback so I think kind of getting in front of somebody who can give give feedback and direct uh, your child before their first book session is a great option. And then yeah, classes, love having the audit option, just exactly like you said, people that maybe aren't quite ready to jump in yet, or aren't ready to dedicate the funds to jumping in fully, you know, have kind of a lesser payment option. And then of course, I have some scholarships for people who are uh, just getting started in their uh, career and might need a little bit of assistance, try to do that as well. Oh, um, that's so and sweet. <laughs> that's great to know. Yeah. And, you know, what I've also started to do a little bit more is try to teach classes that aren't being taught at the moment. Meaning, you know, there's a lot of classes on auditioning. And yes, I, I do do that as well. And, you know, how to create a standout audition or how to find your funny. Like, yes, I do those basic classes as well. But then also, you know, I just developed a class that I'm going to start for the first time next week on laughing. And it's how to laugh in character, how to make your laughs feel real. Because I think that I, I notice a lot in... <laughs> in records, people struggle with that. Kids struggle with that of trying to get that natural laugh. Also developing a class called More Than Words that I've been doing where it's the stage direction, where it's the sounds and the efforts that you have to make in order to sell the scene that are just more than the lines of dialogue. So um, the one example I give, you know, got to play around with it is, okay, great. Now you're on the teacups ride at Disneyland. How does that sound? 
you know, and kind of having to do that. And I'm like, and you love it. And then they do that. And then it's, and you hate it. And how that sounds different. So just kind of playing with the acting as well as the sounds. So yeah, that's been a big focus this year. Love all that. Love all that. Through my career thus far, because sometimes we'll just want like a baby sound or some kind of like bird or an animal sound. And I'm like, yo, I should just like put these sounds in a file folder so I don't have to do it every time. I can just like submit because it's sometimes it's hard. It's hard to get to those places and do those things all the time. What do you think? I mean, if you're in a scene, obviously, and, you're, and the button is laughing haha, at the end, can't do it then. But what if it's just like maybe like a, a baby or something, if the person's not doing it live, but they just have like this, like a demo reel or like an audition of that thing? Do you ever get any of those? Or is that, is that no, like- I think for the most part, people are doing it live because there's a specific, like all laughs are not equal, right? Like, is it an awkward laugh, a nervous laugh, just a cutesy laugh or whatever the case is. So sometimes it's specific acting to the scene. But I think, well, I mean, if you're doing an audition at home and you have a little baby gurgle that you can just pop in, sure, you could probably do that. But I think uh, in the context of recording a show, you might need to do it live. Yeah. So pivoting into 2023, where we are right now, (laughs) and from where you were, I mean, It's just the technology things are, you know, ever evolving. So what are some like, yes, like these are the things that I like. These are the things that are working. So when talent or anyone approaches you in any which way in that regard, and maybe, you know, reaching out to you for an opportunity, like what are some things that are green flags for you that are well received of how they try to reach out to you? Or is it don't just go through your agent? Well, yes, green flags. I think, you know, I love hearing email updates of what people are doing and things they love for me to check out where I don't have to necessarily respond to them. Because the second I'm asked for a response, it's putting a little bit of pressure. Oh, okay, I have to come back with a thoughtful email to respond or, you know, hey, take a look at my new demo reel and please write back your thoughts. You know, and it's like, oh, okay. So now not only am I listening to it, but then I have to critique it, which just takes a lot more time. And sometimes I just don't get to it. And if it's, hey, check out my new demo reel, thought you might like it and just send it. And I, you know, great. I take a listen. Oh, okay, cool. I put it, you know, in the pile of things that I do like. That's a lot easier for me to do, you know, as opposed to kind of the work of it. So green flag is just sending me stuff, updating me where I don't have to do a carefully uh, detailed response. (laughs) Yeah, you can just digest it, enjoy it. And then, I mean, your job and as a human, you sow the seed. And then so if a project is coming and it aligns, you're like, oh, and maybe I think of that person. They sent me that demo reel. It was really funny. And maybe I'll call them or email them to audition for something. Or if you know the agency that they're with, that they maybe put the agency below, you know, just to contact the agent to maybe have them be an opportunity. Because I've seen and heard that, you know, and what I got from you actually recently, and I just started doing it because I wasn't doing it before, hashtagging my name, right? So when you're finding people online and you're saying, be very clear about those hashtags, You can't find what you're looking for. It's really important that when you're searching that you're able to be searchable. So um, do you want to elaborate on that a little about seeking talent when it's not right in your, you know, vicinity or comfort zone? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my general process is I do go through agents to get auditions. But sometimes if I am struggling to find a role or if there's something very specific, I'll start to look around and poke through YouTube and, you know, do Google searches and just see what I find. Um, For example, you know, I needed a, uh, you know, parody voice for Animaniacs and I couldn't necessarily find it. And I Google searched the person, you know, where it's like, uh, just, you know, type in what I need, parody or impression or whatever the case is and just look up stuff. That happens. That, that We do that, you know, just know that, that happens. And it's like my worst fear is that like I click on a video and there's no name, no nothing. I can't figure out how to get that person in the video that I love or how to contact them. So I end up, you know, trying to do a deep dive and sending them a direct message on Instagram, sending them a Facebook message, sending them a Twitter DM, you know, kind of going through all the different angles to try to get in touch with that person. So just saying, make it easy on the casting director to be findable um, if they do like something that you did. But I was alerted, and I think this was a good point because I didn't think of it at the time, that some people are uh, don't want to be found in the sense that there is their life could be at stake if, they're, if they could be more in jeopardy, but a certain group doesn't want to be easily tracked. If, it, it was brought to my attention that some trans performers don't want to necessarily put out all of their contact information in ways because people could come at them a little bit you know, hostile. negatively. Or ho- yeah. Hostile, yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. So, they, so for their yeah. own... 
yeah, yeah. Threat, so they don't want to be. And I never even had considered that. And so now I'm kind of trying to figure out how to reframe that. But maybe there is such a way that you can, you know, at least put your name or something that of how yeah. you can be found. So I'm still trying to work out that advice. But my original advice had just been, you know, put your contact information, make sure your INDB pro is up to date with how to get in touch so I can do my Google search and find you with your website or something. So working how to adjust that so that all performers feel safe doing that, you know, what is the best way? I don't know if this is the only solution, but what comes up for me is if they can just, if they're in the realm of something, but don't want to be so specific, just to put like LGBTQA plus I, right? That could be one instead of like, singling it out to like just that one thing that could maybe be a possibility. The other thing I want to mention lastly on this topic is I think it's really important that you just said that because with social media, with the bots and the algorithm and the up and the down, and it's an emotional mental stress on a lot of people. And a lot of people are like cringe, like, Oh my God, you hashtag so much. They're insecure, but it's a business. It's show business. So like if the talent's listening and they're not in a hazardous situation, they're able to post, who cares if everyone else is saying like you hashtag too much, like no, it's your business. And it's important to put those certain hashtags on there. So people like Sarah can find you like it's it just gives me this inner confidence because I've had a lot of people, you know, try to shame and blame of like me doing too many hashtags. But I mean, people say whatever they want. That's just like one situation. But by you hearing that, it gave me like a new whiff of confidence. I have a purpose. I know why I'm doing this. It's important. You know, I wasn't hashtagging my name, but now I've been doing stand up and I've been hashtagging my name because then people can call me, which is which is great. So hopefully that exactly. I mean, what's interesting, too, is so say someone submits an audition. Uh, I take that audition, I send it up the chain. I send it up to executives, executive producers. And if that audition didn't fully sell them, sometimes what I do is I also send along clips of their other work. So like you said, I'll look on, you know, I'll search their name and say, oh, here's a couple of funny stand-up things that are in character, kind of in line with what we're looking for. And I'll watch a bunch of their materials. So kind of being able to put it all together. I mean, yes, I could also reach out to agents or reach out to them directly. But if I don't want to wait and I just want to sift through what's out there too, it is helpful to have those hashtags where I can just kind of great, you know, check this out, you know, see what they think just to supplement auditions as well. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, not too long ago, my voiceover agency, they had me upload my reel to Actors Access. So um, are you at this point utilizing Actors Access for talent through agencies or no? It's funny because I personally don't, but my daughter has an agent and her stuff is up there. So it, it's very funny because I think maybe so some people probably do, um, but I don't for what I need at this point. Yeah. And I mean, she must be like 11, like really young. Yeah. Seven, seven and, and a half. half. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Cause I remember when you were just like on number one. Yeah. 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 I too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I remember when you did the name change and everything. So very cool. Um, let's circle back around to maybe some fun stories, like from one of the shows, a a memorable show that you're really proud of, um, that was really memorable for you and why. You're going to make me choose between my babies. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. No, I mean, um, I've gotten to work on a lot of great shows. I think the craziest thing is some of these shows were completely done remotely, you know, which is bananas. You know, right now I just had most recent launch was uh, My Dad, the Bounty Hunter that just came out on Netflix season one. And that show was, you know, done completely remote where I have not seen the lower half of the rest of my team ever. <laughs> Everything was, you know, waste up. I was really proud of that show. That was great. Because I think uh, there was a little while where a lot of the shows I was doing were were very cartoony with, you know, Looney Tunes cartoons and Animaniacs and Cuphead kind of wacky, zany uh, cartoons and stuff too. So these past couple of years, they haven't all come out yet, but I've gotten to do a lot more serious uh, non-comedy, some Marvel stuff that have really kind of stretched me as a director and a casting director of just what I can do to kind of say, hey, I'm not just uh, wacky, wacky stuff. You know, I do do some serious stuff as well. So so that's been really cool. And um uh, still under NDAs for a lot of those. So those will come out soon. Yeah, that's a thing though. You know what I mean? It's like the NDAs. It's like you want to share it. And it's like you have these NDAs, some stuff you can't share. When I was watching the Cupheads, I, I had no idea who True Valentine was. And I was like looking him up. I mean, he works nonstop. 
Yeah, Chu Valentino is great. And Valentino, um, yeah. Yeah, he's on the rookie. He's live action stuff too. So he's all over the place. You know, the, the cool part, not necessarily Frank, but some of the others, you know, this was kind of a, a first time show for um, a lot of people as well. Like kind of a, a bigger role for uh, some actors. So that was pretty cool. Their first time in animation. But yeah, True is great. Frank Todaro and Johanna and Luke Millington Drake. I mean, they're a fantastic cast. They were a lot of fun. Yeah. And I love the opening credits. It's that old classic when you're watching the cartoons and then you have yeah. your own title card, you know, of yeah. not only you casting, but your voice directing the series. So I'm like, whoa, I was like so proud of you. That's so major. Congratulations. That's so cool. Thank you. That did, that did feel like a big deal. I, I noticed that. I was like, eh, look, okay. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, boom, just like just you there. I'm like, whoa. And what were their accents? It was a uh, very unique, like New York, New Jersey, like what were their accents uh, in that show? You know, uh, East Coast, that was kind of where we directed, you know, it was kind of starting out with like transatlantic, mid-Atlantic, but like East Coast was was the feel we were all going for. And then do you ever come to the East Coast and do any projects or can you do it all just from California? Well, when I worked with Jon Stewart, uh, he was based in New Jersey. So I was going to New Jersey, but like one week a month just to kind of check in with the team there because um, they were all in person. Um, but that was before the pandemic. But now, I mean, I do stuff internationally from my home in California, you know, worked with an actor in London this morning. So I had a 7 a.m. record, you know, just, uh, all over the time zones, you know, all hours. <laughs> all yeah. Hours, yeah get it done. And then are you on Source Connect doing these uh, recordings? I'm not. Uh, Zoom, for the most part, a lot of them are on Zoom. And then actors connect in, Source Connect through a, with a studio. And then we just connect in through Zoom. So they have a clean feed. Clean feed is another one that they actually use. There's a plug for clean feed. Uh, they have a clean feed into the studio. The studio can record and IPDTL or IPDTL that they also record into so that the files are clean, but then I just uh, can interact with them over Zoom. Yeah, I used uh, clean feed uh, recently. It was pretty clean, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That feed is clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do Is it just audio or do you ever do uh, visuals with them as well? Or is it just audio? Uh, for the most part, both, I guess. Uh, for the most part, they're on camera and I can see them, but we're not necessarily recording uh, their visuals, but just they're recording their audio. Sometimes we do record uh, the Zoom as well for the animators. Sometimes if we're doing table reads or things like that, they, you know, use the facial expressions for animating uh, just to yeah. have for their reference. You mentioned you were working on a project right now. Are you able to talk about that one? I got a couple. Let's see. Well, I'm trying to think of like going down the list. So right now I'm on a couple projects with Dan Harmon. Uh, I'm doing a show called Crapopolis for Fox, which is exciting. First show for Fox. But now that Fox is in the Disney family, maybe I don't know, maybe all full circle here at that point. So that's yeah, going to be coming out this year. I saw that. Um, I think I auditioned for it for a while ago, but it was very like Grecian theme. And I'm like, oh, I'm yes. going to book this. I'm Greek. I'm like, I'm going to book this. I'm like, those are the columns, the signs. I'm like, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> but um, that's very cool. So um, I'm excited to check that one out. Very neat. Yeah. And then I'm back uh, at Disney with Disney's Hamster and Gretel that I record um, with the Dan Povemeyer from Phineas and Ferb. So that's his show. And I voice direct it and yeah I'm, trying, I'm going to yeah I think those are all the ones I can currently talk about <laughs> my head blew off three times already so I I can't imagine what the listeners feeling right now I'm just like melting over here I mean that's so cool that is so cool and I was actually just like watching animations. This is so awesome because this is my job. I just get to listen the voices and the direction. And your technique is actually very specific. It's like creme de la creme, high quality, very, because I did the workshop with you. So I saw like, you know, how you work specifically, but you really turn those characters. Like you're, you're really high and then you're crying. Like you're really up and down, you know, in that transitioning on a dime and everything. So do you want to go into that process and like how you found your language as a director? Everyone has their own thing. And yours is very apparent to me now because I've been, you know, studying your work. Well, I think, you know, I'm still learning. I, I mean, honestly, if there was a class on voice directing, I would take it as well. Like I'm still, I think, developing and, you know, making it up as I go along and trying to fit, uh, adapt to what I do to my actors, to the executive producers I work with, because every show is different and every um, producer has a different level of how much they want to be involved and how much they want to say to talent. And, you know, if they're talking right next to me even more and I'm just setting up the takes and they're, they're doing the directing, you know what I mean? Or they're not paying attention 
you as much and I'm directing or whatever the case is. You know, I mean, there's a whole a whole range of what I do. But I think I'm really for pushing that comedy and making those fast turns. You know, like you said uh, before, it's like high highs into a low low. So, you know, going from high pitch into low pitch, going from fast to slow, going from loud to soft and kind of making those fast turns so that you really hit that comedy. I mean, I do work on mostly comedy. So it's really kind of trying to highlight that yeah. for talent as well and just making their voice as funny as they can be. Because a lot of times people forget that on camera, they're relying on their facial expressions or their posture or, you know, they, it's not just their voice, but obviously in voice acting, all we have is your voice. So how do you make that as funny and humorous as possible in the delivery? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm a person with a lot of energy, right? And I, I'm able to go there. But even when you do that over and over, I remember you mentioning, okay, someone thinks they can like carry a series, but they can do it for like, three to five lines, but can you carry a whole series? Like maintain the consistency of the character, like through the whole arc of it, you know? And it takes a lot and it's a workout emotionally, even though it's fun to do. After it's fun, I mean, yeah, it keeps being fun if you're really into it, but it really takes a lot of discipline and practice. So what's some like good tips and advice for people to be brushing up and always like being a part of their craft, different things that they can do in a rotation to make sure they're oiling different parts of, you know, the machine or vessel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first and foremost is obviously stay hydrated. You know, that's an easy one. Have tea if you need to at the session <laughs> as well. You know, and there's a, obviously a lot of people that, you know, tea with vocal straws and kind of the blowing bubbles and things like that. And even practicing these voices little by little, you don't want to go from zero to 90, you know, oh, I don't ever do this voice too. I'm doing four hours of a very tough voice on my throat. Where you place the voice um, trying not to put it right in your throat, you know, kind of if it can, you know, come from your diaphragm or wherever. Don't be afraid to ask for what you need in a session. I think that would be a big one I would want to highlight for your listeners in that if you need a break, ask for a break. You know, like there, you don't need to be a hero because then if your voice dies later, that's not going to work. But if it's like, okay, that was a little strenuous or, you know what, can we save the screams to the end? Or, hey, can we do this? I've never had a director or a scene director be like, no, no, you need to scream your head off now. You know, sometimes they just forget or don't even think or don't even realize. So asking for what you need for your success or your vocal success in a record would be um, something yeah. I want to leave your listeners with. Can I just have a five minute break? I feel like I'm maybe, you, you know, straining my voice a little bit here or whatever the case is. Protect yourself. You don't want to go until you can't work. You know, where like all of a sudden then you can't finish the session or you don't want to go where like you've lost your voice entirely and then you're useless the rest of the day and tomorrow and the next day, you know, uh, save yourself, be kind to yourself and your voice. Yeah, great. I cannot believe what time it is because I feel like uh, we're like just getting started. But yo, I'm so grateful for you. Uh, I appreciate you so much. Congratulations on everything. I would like to hone in with maybe one or two more things. One, it doesn't have to be with voiceover acting. Just someone that like inspires you a book growing up or that you've read a couple times that you want to share i am still reading books how to direct actors you know looking on like how to be a leader too like i love reading those kinds of things um because right now my genre of choice which is not uh, going to help anyone i read a lot of female memoirs of you know just kind of uh, female empowerment and just hearing women's stories and I love listening to the audiobook versions. They're telling their own story through their words and how they would deliver it. So that's one of my favorite things to do right now that I take a yeah. lot of walks and listen to those. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's where I draw my inspiration to. Um, but yeah. a range, all different types of people. Other women forethought leaders. I love that. And <laughs> it's um, International Women's Day on the A. So we're going to oh. be... International Women's Month. So I have to make sure I post this episode during International Women's Month for sure. Yeah, okay. definitely. I think I was going to say, I, I don't know if this was going to be it, but I was going to say, oh yeah, if there's like one or two things you've learned along the way where you would have subtly shift to the left or to the right of like, in hindsight, if you would have known something like not to do this or not to do that. And it could be just for you personally in the entertainment industry or something that you see from actors all the time, anything that's just like, that does just doesn't work or things you've tried. And maybe you're just like, that's, that's just because sometimes we try things over and over. And then we're just like, that just doesn't work. So is yeah. how, how has that been in your journey so far? Well, you know, one thing I really learned in voice directing was you can't have an ego in the room. It isn't my take that's king. 
You know, it's uh, it really is that collaborative effort. I think in my first couple shows, I got my feelings hurt or I let my feelings get hurt when, you know, I'd say, great, let's try it this way. And maybe the producer or director or, you know, showrunner was like, nah, I don't like that. Okay. You know, and then I was like, oh, terrible. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, and immediately kind of personalized that. But really remembering a lot of what I do is a service job. I am trying to get the vision that they have in their head and help kind of elevate their baby, their project and, you know, contribute what I can to it and realize that it is a collaborative effort and you got to pull ego out of it. So that was kind of the first thing that I had. And I, you know, recommend actors to do that too. If, you know, great, let's try another take. It has nothing to make, you know, that that last one does not mean the last take was terrible um, by any means, but Hey, we're exploring. We're trying to say, okay, great. That's, you know, this sounds amazing. What happens if we just do the opposite? Okay. Where does this character live as we start to develop characters and stuff? So I guess my big advice and the hard lesson I learned was just to take your ego out of it, take my ego out of it. Wow. That's a really, really good one. It's so big empowering because to not internalize it. Right. And that's, like beating self up and just like internalizing it's gonna just bring our self-worth and our self-esteem down and you know Don Miguel Ruiz the four agreements the number one agreement do not take anything personal yeah. and wow yeah it that's and that takes years I mean it takes people years to to figure that out so thank you for sharing that you know because I mean we have our highs we have our successes we have our lows and failures but to be able to to share those kind of vulnerable things just to show like we're human and, you know, talk about those things. Like we're all growing and working through those things, like really makes an impact. So thank you so much. I appreciate those words. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Animaniacs. I mean, it's like, it's like ah. Okay. Thank you so much for tuning in. Oh my God. You've been fabulous. You're welcome on She's All Over the Place every day, all the time. Yeah. So if you want to uh, look at the link below, uh, we do giveaways every show ongoing. And so I talked with Sarah and so I can arrange for you to have an audit. If you're an adult, you can do an audit in one of her workshops. How does that sound? Exciting, right? So make sure you share this with at least one person on all social media. If you know someone who has a wacky, kooky voice, kind of like mine, a walking, talking cartoon, just share with them. They may want to know about voiceovers. You never know. It's important to share and care. This is all educational advice no financial advice. There's nothing promised here. We're just showing up and sharing our experiences. And we had a major success and a golden win by having Sarah Jane Sherman on today. Thank you so much, Sarah. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. Yay. See you next time. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Kiriaki, over and out. <laughs>